Good morning. What Daniela said needs no repeating, but I do want to really stress one thing that she said. So I guess I am repeating this one point, and that is, in an effort for us as a church to be good stewards with God's money, I do ask that you would, you would uh, number one, be here on Wednesday night, and number two, put down on your card today simply one sandwich, five sandwiches, two salads, whatever, and that'll help us be prepared for you. We as a church are spending about $4 on each uh, sa- uh, sandwich and about $6 on each salad. So if you're able to come and voluntarily give that money uh, as, you're, as, you, as we eat on Wednesday night, that's great. As I tell you always, if you don't have the money on you, just come and eat anyway, and you can catch up some other time if, if that's, if that's uh, where you're at financially. But we do look forward to seeing you on, on Wednesday uh, at, at 6.30 and, and for our prayer time Tuesday at 7. Okay, so... Um, let me say something that I don't hardly ever say um, about my sermons. Uh, whether or not it's true, I don't hardly ever say this, and that is that I believe if you will latch on to, to the truth, this ethic, this truth that is woven throughout today's teaching, it will change your life. Now, as a preacher, I, I attempt to get up here every week and, and speak the Word of God, believing that the Word of God is life-changing. So I believe that to be true every week. But in a, in a very special sense, the, the truth, the ethic that I'm going to lay, lay out before you today, I believe it to be life-changing if you'll grab a hold of it and, and ingest it and, and make it yours. We're coming on the heels of last week's um, look at a story that Jesus told. We're, we're going to re-look at a story that Jesus told. It's called a parable. And uh, this is the, one of his most famous parables. It is the parable of the wayward son the son who wandered off and ultimately came back. I want to remind you of the context because you've, you've slept several times since last week's sermon and also because some of you weren't here last week. The context is this. Jesus is reclining or sitting at a table, which was what he would often do with his friends as he would tell them stories. He's reclining at a table, and he has around the table his, uh, the people that he spent most most of his time with, or at least much of his time with, and and those were people that were outcasts. They were called, some translations refer to them as as notorious sinners. I said it last week. I just love that phrase. Jesus hung out with notorious sinners. Um, These were people that were considered sinners not in the sense that we say, oh, we're all sinners saved by God's grace, which is, is true according to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the teaching of the New Testament. They were sinners not in that sense, but they were culturally called sinners by the religious folk because of the job that they, that they worked. Maybe they were maybe a tax collector. Uh, maybe, maybe they, they, they worked... Um, as prostitutes. Um, so they were, they, were, they were outcasts because of their profession. <clears throat> or they were outcasts because of their ethnic diversity. <clears throat> or they were outcasts because they had some, um, some sort of physical challenge in their lives. A skin disease or a a limb that didn't work exactly the way that it ought to work. And so they were called sinners, and and Jesus was accused often of hanging around with sinners. And it was a slur. It was was something that they looked down upon Jesus for. So he was sitting around this table, uh, reclining at the table. He's no doubt uh, sharing a meal with these these outcasts, and, and what, if you can just get this in your mind, 
about eight feet behind the outcasts who are, who are happy to share a meal with Jesus. <clears throat> about eight feet beyond them um, are the religious folks, the scribes, the Pharisees, with, with judgmental looks on their faces. And, and beyond that, beyond the fact that they're judging and the, the outcasts are just, are just, just glad to be there, um, the, the other stark contrast, the other stark contrast between these two groups that are both listening to Jesus tell this parable, the other stark contrast is that, that the people around the table, the outcasts, there seems to be joy and affection in their hearts. And, and in contrast, the religious folk that are just a few feet away, there seems to be sadness, anger, there's just, there's just this upsetness that, 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 that seems to not be consoled. So that's the context. And I, I believe that to be the context based on all of the Gospels and just the stories of how Jesus interacted with humanity. But, but I, I believe it especially because it starts like this. Luke chapter 15, the whole chapter begins with, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to Jesus, and the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, well, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And so Jesus told them this parable. And so chapter 15 has three parables. Um, this time around, we're not going to hit on the other two parables. We're just spending time in this, this one parable which is the third parable. He told three parables back to back there at that one sitting. Um, <clears throat> but the parable that we're really drilling down deep and even deeper on this week is the parable known as the prodigal son. And so I'm going to just briefly summarize it for you. I encourage you today to maybe get your lawn chair and go sit out under a tree because it's a beautiful day and read through all three uh, parables um, I'm going to summarize the third one briefly because I, I, we, we looked at it in detail last week. So this is how it goes. There are two sons, and their father has means. He has wealth. And they're agrarian. They, they clearly have, uh, they're doing farming and, and, and ranching. And so the two sons, um, the older son was, was um, set to maybe get 60% or perhaps a little more of his father's wealth upon his father's death. And the younger son was set to, to get approximately, uh, approximately 40%, uh, maybe less. The, the older son, 60%, maybe more. Uh, so the, the younger son was, was set to get about 40% of his father's wealth when, uh, when they died, when his, when his father died. And, and also there was a certain amount of money that would be set aside for dowry because perhaps they would have had sisters who would have, need, would have needed that in order to get married. So one day the son abruptly, at least in the parable, it seems rather abrupt, abrupt, he, abruptly he comes to the father and he says, Father, ultimately I'm going to receive your, this inheritance. Just give it to me now. Just give it to me now. Why wait? And so the, 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 the father does that. He gives the younger son his, his inheritance at that point. And the, uh, the younger son immediately packs his bags and decides to go see the world. And he, he leaves and he, he goes on a trip and he does things that he told himself he would never do. I mentioned this last week. There's probably, this is, this is probably a, uh, an experience that you've had in your life. There may be things that you said, you know, um, I'll do this, but I'll never, I'll never do that. You know, like, like I last week, I said, maybe you'd say, you know, maybe I'll, I'll smoke weed, but I'll, I'll, never be a, I'll never be an addict, or I'll, um, I'll, look at, I'll, I'll look at porn, but I'll never be a cheater, or, you know, and, and ultimately you end up doing things that you said you would never do, and, and, um, and so, so that's what happened to the younger son. He goes out and he does those things that he said he'd never do, and, 
And he hits rock bottom, and he runs out of money, and he's eating out of the trash, and ultimately he says, I'm going to go back to my father. He has this epiphany, this aha moment. He says, I'm going to go back and, and, and talk, to my fa- talk to my father. And he rehearses the line, and it goes something like, Father, I'm no longer fit to be your son. You know, I've done, I've, I've done too much wrong. I, I'm no longer to fit, fit to be your son, but I know that even your servants have a better life than I do. So m- might I come back and, and live uh, as one of your servants, you know, uh, <clears throat> three square meals and a job <clears throat> sort of thing. And he, he gets to the property, the family compound, and, and, and apparently his father is watching because his father leaps off the porch and runs out and hungs. Uh, no, he doesn't hang him. He hugs him. He, he, <clears throat> he hugs, uh, he hugs his, his, his younger son. And uh, the, the younger son tries sheepishly to get out this line that he rehearsed about, you know, about wanting to just be a slave, just be a servant. But, but his father will have none of it. His father gives him rings, and his father uh, gives him shoes, and, and his father gives him a, a jacket. And his father says, you know, slaughter the young, the, 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 the young steer, and let's have a party. All that we looked at last week. And ultimately, if you recall, the older son comes back from the field, and he's, he's angry, and he's judgmental. And the main contrast that I see between the younger son and the older son is that the younger son is really able to rest in the extravagant, compassionate love that his father has for him. And in contrast to that, the older son, who has been dutiful, who has been loyal, who has continued to work the family farm, seems to have no, no space in his, in his head, no no room in his heart to, to accept and to experience the, the compassionate love that his father has for him. And so the father, in contrast to the, um, the, son's, the older son's anger, when he says, look, this, this younger son of yours, he left he trashed your name. He embarrassed you. Yet I've served you all these years that you've never given me a cow that I might have a party for my friends. And, and, and the, father, the father makes two profound statements to his older son. If we can look at those, chapter, verse 31 of the same chapter, he says this. He says, son, number one, You are always with me. And number two, everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead. He's alive again. He was lost. He's found. The word of the Lord for which I am thankful that, that's all a preface to what I want to talk to you about today. That's the, the, the springboard, the jumping off point. Um, what we're going to talk about today is this. God's message for you today is that He looks on you with, fec- with affection. If you're in this room today, if you're a Christ follower, you've submitted your life to Christ then, then what the Father wants you to hear today is that He celebrates you. He loves you with a deep compassion. In the parable that we, that, that's, that's our jumping off point today, in, in the parable, the Father looks on both sons with deep affection. The younger son receives it and believes it and experiences it, and the older son He just looks at his dad with disdain, unable to really embrace and experience the love of the Father. 
Now, if, if this was just the only passage that I, had, that I could use today to say, look, look, you may not believe this, but, but your father has a deep affection and eternal personal love and compassion that is always directed in you, toward you. If, if this was the only passage, well, that would be enough, but, but it's not. I want to take you on a journey today that I believe is a hard sell for many of you. Because I believe that for many of us, we, we would say, we believe this for others. We would say, yeah, the Lord is compassionate toward the lost. The Lord is compassionate toward his children. The, the Lord, our, our, our Father in heaven, he has a deep love for every other Christian in the world. I believe that with all my heart, but I just don't know that I believe it for me. Now, I want to give you, uh, I, want to, I want to give some credit here right at the beginning of this passage. Uh, Dr. Sam Storms, who's a pastor in Oklahoma and a, one of my heroes, he writes much on this. And much of what I'm going to say today is, is informed um, by his good work on, on, on a passage in Zephaniah, which we're going to look at. He wrote a book many years ago called The Singing God. And if you want to, if, if you want to, to dive a little deeper into this, this beautiful truth that the Lord loves you with a compassionate love, then, then I would encourage you to get that book, The Singing God by Sam Storms. Today is a message for those of us who are dealing, though we call ourselves Christians, though we have committed our lives to Christ, we're dealing with a deep level of low-grade dissatisfaction. I'm going to ask that you not you know, raise your hand or, 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 or draw attention to yourself today, but, but just, just think to yourself, is that you? Is maybe there's is, is there perhaps some some low grade sort of resentment toward God? We're not going to turn there, but but in the passage that we looked la, looked at last week in Luke 15, it's verse 29. We hear it in the words of of the older son who says this. Listen to his heart. The older son says, "Look." These many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. But the fact is, the older son had, had, had lost any sense of delight in his father. He was just under the, un, living under the roof and, 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 and just there physically, but, but he'd long ago stopped enjoying the satisfying pleasure of of his father's presence. That's clear when he says, I wish that you would give me, a, give me a, a steer that I might slaughter it and have a party with my friends. He had long since lost any sense of joy in, 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 in just the presence of the father. Here's the highest hurdle, and I, I'm taking a long time on this intro today because it's a hard sell. Here's the, here's the highest hurdle that we aim to clear today. I don't believe, or I don't think that you believe that the Father really looks on you with affection. And I'm going to do all that I can through Scripture today to convince you of that, to compel you of that, to, to believe that. But the fact is, if the, if the Holy Spirit, uh, less the whole, or what we need is for the Holy Spirit to, to move through this room and to supernaturally convince you of this truth. The old phrase, a fresh wind and a fresh fire. We need the Holy Spirit to blow, to move. He's here. Of course he is. He's always here. The, the, the Lord goes wherever he chooses to go, but, but, but oh, that we might not miss his presence today. I need to unpack the, the, the word of God carefully today, but we need for the Holy Spirit to move, lest we'll never be convinced. Some of us here, we've been in church for a long time. We've been dutiful. We've, we've served the Lord well. We, we've, we've, we've obeyed his commands. And yet, and yet if, we're, if we would voice our silent thoughts, 
might go something like, is this all there is to it? Is this all I, is this all I get out of it? Jesus, in telling this parable, is pointing to a deep level of dissatisfaction in the lives of of those people eight to ten feet away. The the religious, the self-righteous, the church-going, the faithful to the cause, the Bible-carrying, the veterans. And that's some of us this morning. Now maybe for you, maybe you're, 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 you're slumbering, you're asleep, maybe you, you've already checked out, I want to kind of bring you back. I want to, I'm going to ask you some questions that will maybe help you identify if there's dissatisfaction in your own heart, it might go something like this. Let me ask these questions. Don't answer out loud. Number one, are you always on edge? Feel, feeling some, some tightness, some quick quick to anger? Do your children redirect the, 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 the tension? Does your, does your spouse have to redirect the emotions of the day just because you're, you're quick to get spun up? Question number two, do, do you, are you afraid, are you afraid that you might not achieve enough in life to make yourself worthy of the space that you're taking up on this earth? Are you afraid, do you have a secret fear that you might not achieve enough in life to make yourself worth or worthy of the space in which you are taking up? Question number three. Do you fear that others might find out your, your weakest traits, your, your weakest characteristics, and then, and then use that against you? I think that dissatisfaction, even dissatisfaction in God and what he's given me in life and, and, and the... the the race that he's given me to, 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 to run. I think dissatisfaction in that can at times be such, such a low-grade sort of dissatisfaction that we don't even realize that it's there in a chronic fashion all the time. So I said earlier, and I, I know it maybe sounds a little weird or melodramatic, but I said, I believe that, that, that today's message can be game-changing. You can actually make today a turning point, a hinge pin, and you can actually find more and more, a little more today, and a little more the next day, satisfaction in the Lord. That, that today can be the beginning of a new journey for you. And I believe, it, I believe it begins with understanding how immensely and how intensely is God's compassion God's love toward you. You say, you don't know me, Randy. I'm not lovable. You don't know me. You don't, I don't love myself. Others shouldn't love me. You don't know me. And I would say that is true for some of you. I do know some of you pretty well. but I, Some of you I don't know, but, but here's, what, here's what's more important. I know God. And I know what the, what, what, what the Bible in its entirety says about the Lord. And the key to understanding God's love for you, listen to this. The key to understanding God's love for you isn't a, a, a laser beam fascination with how bad you are, how unlovable you are. No, no, a, a key to understanding God's love for you is rather a focus on who God is, an understanding of the goodness of your Father God. If you believe that God merely tolerates you, that, that, that he's, you know, he, he, he barely saved you, he forgave you, but you're still, you're still not off the hook. Or, or maybe you believe that God is re repulsed by you. Or he's loathing. Then frankly, who, who, would, want to, who would want to get near to, near to a God like that? 
I believe this, this, this false data point in your life may be the cause of the distance that you feel between you and who would want, who would want to spend time with the God who, who quietly loathes him. And, and so what, how does this play out as a result? Instead, instead, we live lives in which we try to win friends and we try to influence people and we we, <clears throat> we, we try to, 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 to convince people that, that, that I'm actually not who I really am. I am this facade that I want you to, to see and believe in, and, and it leads us to the brink of exhaustion. We spend so much time and energy and resources trying to prove to others, like, I'm successful I'm, I'm valuable, I'm worth loving, I'm worth appreciating, I'm worth valuing, I'm, I'm something. Won't you believe that I'm something? And, and we spend so much time and energy and resources trying to convince myself I can be happy and I can be fulfilled and I, I, I'm, I'm important. One day, one day it's finally all going to come together and I, I'm going to make something of my life and, and then I will be fulfilled and, and then I will be satisfied and, and then I will be happy. But what? What if I could thoroughly convince you that God, He enjoys you? I mean, that's strange language for some of you. That God, that God sings over you. That God plans to keep you around for eternity. He's preparing a place for you. That, 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 he has, he, that He has shared with you all of His resources for eternity. That your Father God in heaven is filled with compassion for you. If you were really convinced of that, would that be enough? And I believe the answer is yes. Think of the amount of effort we put into hiding the real me, lest others get to know me and reject me. All the effort put into keeping up a public image, covering shame, all the anxiety and all the worry and all the fear and all the sleeplessness and all the money you spend trying to create for yourself a life that has meaning and purpose and value. And, and we don't even know exactly how to define those terms, but those terms seem to be what we're after. And you, might have been told, you might have been told in order to achieve peace in your life, I mean, maybe you've heard this on TV. Maybe you've heard this in the church. In order to, 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 to achieve peace, you're looking for inner satisfaction. Well, you're, you're going to you're gonna have to lose weight. You're going you're gonna to have to make more money. You're going to have to get a better job. You're going to have to get a better car. You, you're going you're gonna to maybe need to get some new friends. And by golly, you're going to need to start believing in yourself. But what if every one of us, and I say us because I need this message probably more than you. What if we could be con completely convinced God loves me beyond measure. And God has a total future and hope prepared for me for eternity and while I, I while I, I do value this life in the next for me 50 years or so I, I do value that the, the the ethic of the Bible is that I am built for for eternity and God has a purpose and, and, and hope laid up for me for eternity this is the essence of Jesus parable the father says to the son remember the father says to the son son all I have is yours. And he says, son, you will live in my presence for eternity.
As I said, if this was the only passage, I suppose that would be enough, but it's not the only passage. Let's go to a very obscure book. You may have trouble finding it. We're going to project it. You can find it in your Bible if you'd like. I'd, I would encourage you to bring your Bibles and use them, but we're also going to project it. It's a, it's a, it's a rather small and obscure book called Zephaniah. And this passage, like several others in the Bible, speaks of how the Lord rejoices, dances, celebrates over you. Let's read it. It says, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Let me celebrate the word of the Lord today. Okay, so we're going to unpack this. We're going to, we're going to rest. We're going to spend some time and linger in this passage for just a moment. But before I do that, I think I, because again, this is a hard sell. I think I, I, I need to address um, whether or not this, pa- this passage is for us. Lest you wonder, especially if you're an astute, astute Bible scholar, there are some here today, lest you wonder, like, is this really for me? I mean, that was written a long time ago, Pastor Randy. That was written toward the nation of Israel, Pastor Randy. Is, that, is this for me? And I would say, yes. Yes, this, this was written. Yes, it was written to Israel, God's chosen people. Uh, but what, is, what does the New Testament say about us? It says that we are the church and that we are now grafted into this olive tree, symbolically, that, that is, as non-Jews, that we as Christians, through, through Christ's work on, on the cross, we are now grafted in. We become recipients of God's covenant promises that he has made. This is the essence of being a child of God. And then beyond that, if I, if I, if I get, a less, get, get, get a little bit less theological on you, Beyond that, this is, this is just generally speaking, this is the picture of our Father God in heaven and how he looks down on his children. And as he looked down on his children thousands of years ago, this is what he said. Wouldn't it be true if God doesn't change that now, thousands of years later, he looks down on his children, the church in this age, and he, he feels the same sort of compassion. So let's unpack this. There are really three things that I want to, to draw out, and I don't have time to linger on, on any of them for a while, for, for, for very long. But the first thing he says is this, that the Lord is in your midst. The, the Lord is here. He, he's not just here in this room, but he's in the midst in the sense that he is with you. You leave this space, he goes with you. You go home, and he is with you. You can't escape his presence. He is in your midst I could preach a sermon. I could preach a sermon series on that. That's not quite as hard to sell, so we're going to leave it at that today. That's the first thing that he says. The Lord is in your midst. He's in your presence. You can't escape it. You can't go to the end of the earth and escape God. You can't, you can't hide in your bed all morning long and escape God. You can't, you can't cross the border and go deep into the interior of Mexico and escape. The Lord is in your midst. Okay, we'll leave it at that. The second thing that's said in this passage is he rejoices over you with gladness. He rejoices over you with gladness. I was, I was listening to this old recording of, of Keith Green. Many of you don't even know who Keith Green is, but he was a hippie back in the 70s. He died in a, pla- in a plane crash. And uh, he was cut from the cloth of, like, uh, the Doobie Brothers and Michael McDonald, if you, don't, if you even know who those, those guys are. So he was, he was a hippie, but he, was, he loved Jesus. He was a Christ follower. He wrote a lot of good songs. And, and I, was watching, I was listening to this concert the other day, and he said, you know, what many of us don't, don't embrace fully is, 
is that, that, that God looks down on us and, and we're like that little kid who, who's lost a nickel. You know, and some of us, we think that God looks down on us when we lose that nickel and we're like, shut up, kid, it's just a nickel. But no, that's not how you look on your children. What do you do? You're like, oh, little Johnny lost a nickel. You lost a nickel. Don't worry about it, Johnny. I got, I got ten nickels. I got a hundred nickels. What's that up to? Five bucks, right? I can, I can handle, I can handle a hundred nickels. I got a hundred nickels. I got all the nickels that you want. That's how we respond to our children. Because even in our sinfulness, we're, we're, we're good parents. We love our kids. The point is that the God who takes care of the universe and makes sure that the sun comes up every morning, he cares intimately about the small things in your life. He takes care of the details. He rejoices over you with gladness means that he holds a party over you. Like, like, like the father on the porch who, who threw a party over his son's return. He wants to, your, your, your father God, he wants to clothe you in righteousness and he dances over you with delight. And, and God, is, God is filled with compassion for you. Now again, if, now I can say, if, if, that, if that was only true of two passages in the Bible, then it would still be true, just like if it was only true. But I'm going to show you a third. And, tell, and I tell you, there are many, there are numerous, but we have time to look at a few more today. Here's the third passage, Isaiah chapter 62. Listen to the word of the Lord, your Father God, as he speaks these words over you. God says of his children, for as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. God says, as the bridegroom rejoices over, Over the bride, so I rejoice over you. Now, folks, this is so weird. This is so weird. I'll just use that word. I almost didn't even put this passage in today's sermon. It is so weird, but but it's also so startling that I decided to include it. What is what is God saying in this passion? In this passage, God is saying that He has what I'm going to call a honeymoon love for you. Now, if you've been married, I'll just, uh, uh, this, this past summer, Lydia, Lydia's in Nebraska, by the way, she went to, they went to inter, uh, Mary Ann Horn, uh, her mom died a few months ago, and they, they buried her in, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Nebraska, this weekend. and so we had a service here, and now they have service here. Lydia's there, so my wife's not here. But I just want to tell you, I, uh, a honeymoon love for your wife. The bridegroom's love for the bride. I've been married 30 years. I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm here preaching, but part of me is thinking, 5 o'clock, I'm going to Harlingen, and I'm going to pick up my wife at the airport. Why? Because by God's grace, I still have a honeymoon love for my wife. I just, I'm just, I'm just... I'm just not right when she's not here. I just can't wait for her to get home. I'm telling the kids, your mom's going to be home tomorrow in 23 hours and 30 minutes. We need to get this place straightened up. (laughs) I just rejoice when she returns. Now, folks, I know it sounds weird, but the Lord himself, it's not my words, God says that he rejoices over you with a honeymoon sort of love.
This passage is so unfamiliar that it, it borders on weird, doesn't it? The point is that God enjoys your presence. I know it's hard to believe that, but God enjoys your presence. Here's why that's so important. How can I enjoy God? If I honestly don't You may try to win people over, but ultimately, if you think somebody doesn't enjoy being around you, you're, you're going to grow cold. You're not going to want to, you're just going to say, I'm just, I'm just done trying. The Lord loves you with a honeymoon love. The Lord enjoys being with you. He enjoys your presence. Now, the third thing that this passage says, if we can go back to the Zephaniah passage, it's next. The Lord is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. And it says, he will rejoice over you with gladness upon your return. If you're a Christ follower, you've returned. And the third thing it says is that he will quiet you by his love. Now, the, the, uh, the Hebrew could mean a couple of things that are closely related, but what it probably means here is that more than, or not more than, uh, rather than just bringing a quiet presence to the room, that the Lord in your in your stumbling, in your stammering, in your, in your frenetic sort of activities, he says, shh, shh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to quiet you. Like maybe if you're here today and you're like, yeah, whatever, this is a bunch of bunk. Like, like the Lord, like whatever Randy's selling, I'm not buying. Like it, I, this, is, this is just too weird and emotional, and that's not what this passage really says. The Bible didn't really say that. The, the, the Lord maybe today is just saying, shh. Let me, let, me, let me quiet you that you might allow my, my love to just rush over you at this moment. The Lord, the Lord quiets you with his compassion. The Lord is present. The Lord enjoys you. The Lord quiets you with his love. And the last statement is perhaps just the most mind-blowing, the most, the most difficult to wrap my arms around emotionally. The last statement is this. The Lord, he will exult over you with loud singing. Another translation could say he, he sings over you with a loud voice. Now, I've been pondering over the last week, like, what would it sound like if the Lord sang? There are mornings. There are, there are mornings where I'm I'm fishing out on the lower Laguna Madre, out on the bay, and it's so quiet, or maybe there's even a slight east wind, it's so quiet that, that I'm there in the middle of the bay and several miles away is the, the, uh, the beach, and you'll just hear a and People on my boat, people fishing with me, they'll say, what is that noise? And I'll say, believe it or not, that's the ocean. Like, we're miles away, but, but you can hear it this morning. And I think sometimes, might that be the sound 
of the, the voice of the Lord? I, I don't know. Do we hear it in the thunderclap? Do we, do we hear it in the sounds of nature? But, but we know from this passage is that your Father God, it says, He sings over you loudly. Celebrate that. Embrace that. Who sings over someone else? Well, I used to sing over my children when they were little. I still do, and they find it annoying apparently now. But, but when they were little, it seemed to soothe them. I remember when Truett, who's now 26, was just a little bitty baby, and I would, and, and, and I would walk through, he was just three months old or less, and I would walk through the dark living room of our rented home. I was in seminary, and we were young and well, young and dumb, I guess, as parents, but I, I, knew that, I knew that I could sing to my little boy, and, and I would sing to him. So, so God says in that sense, he sings over you. So the Lord, he's in your presence. The Lord, he rejoices over you. The Lord, he quiets you with his love. And the Lord, he sings over you. This is with a loud voice. Now, I would ask, and again, I pray that the Holy Spirit just breathes life and truth into your soul today because short of that, this is just an ethic. This is just a, a, a truth. It's just a belief that you can believe for other people. So I pray that the Lord would, would breathe this deeply into your soul today. But let me ask you this in closing. Can you think of any evidence that God loves you with this type of, of honeymoon love, with this type of, of affection for you personally as his child. I'll take you to Romans 5, and, and then we'll be done. And as we read this passage, I invite the band to, to come on back up. But God shows his love for us in that, we were, in, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God showed his love toward you in that while you were still sinner, while you were in essence unlovable or unlovely, at that moment in time, before you were lovely, before you were all cleaned up, assuming you think you're cleaned up now, before any of that, God demonstrated his love toward you by sending Jesus to the cross. Now, now I've, I've said this before. I, I think it's worth saying again. I've said that, that, that the, the highest hurdle that has ever been cleared in the history of the universe is when God determined to sacrifice his son on your behalf. That God determined, God, God determined at a moment in time, God determined, I'll do that. I'll do that for you and you and you. I, I'll do that. I'll, I'll sacrifice my son. Behold the Father's love for us, that he would sacrifice his son. Now, there's this reasoning in Scripture which says, if, if God will do the easy, I mean, the hard thing, will he not do the comparatively easy thing? If God will do the hard thing, will he not comp do the comparatively easy thing? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up, for the forgiveness of your sins, will he not also give you every good thing? Behold the, lo behold the love of, of your Father God for you today. Rest in that. May this song that the band sings, may it just 
may it just wash over you. You're, you're welcome to just sit and, and take it in. You're welcome to sing along.